Hello and welcome to Aviary Paragraph, the podcaster for birds who love birders who love all things which are bird oriented and also all things which may involve birds. Aviary Paragraph is brought to you by Pacific Thought Foods and Borzoi Books. Aloha and hello on this special themed issue of Aviary Paragraph. This episode we are titling on a very special bird, dear to everyone's heart here in the studio. Here online with me now is the amazing Martin Salinas. Hello, Zan. Hello, Martin, and we would love to start this episode with a theme revealed on this mystery show. We are now officially revealing for the first time the bird for this show. Drum roll, please. And let me tell you this, make uh, make may, uh, may make some of our listeners to this program upset, a little bit bitter. We are now revealing the bird of this show is, of course, the bittern. That's the American bittern. That's a boter... Uh, Botaurus uh, lentiginosus. Lentiginosus. None of the lesser bitterns, such as the uh, zigzag or the Australian, of course. <clears throat> now, in my uh, research for the bittern, I, I went down kind of a internet wormhole, I'd like, I like to say, actually. I was uh, researching sort of scholarly journals on the bittern online, and I kept receiving inter- an interesting link from my Google brand results page. You're talking about the same link over and over. It, it was a constant link, uh, you know, one time, two times, uh, you know, more than that. It was linking me to the Haiku Foundation. Now, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this particular foundation. You, you know, I, no, hold on. Were you talking about Haiku Foundation? Yeah, well, that is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the Haiku Foundation. After several hours, uh, I was researching this. I got a little bit curious, I clicked on the link, and to my surprise, the link took me directly to a page listed that is listed the associations of the Haiku Foundation. I was thinking at that point, what is this? Uh, what has this got to do with the bittern? You you got me wondering the same things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So fr- so so some of these nerds over there at the Evergreen State College over there in Olympia, over here in Olympia, because that's where we live, they've been turning me on to Control F. Now, uh, basically, when you hit that key. Anything on your Google search results page is is going to be you can find something on that page. So I so I hit control F and I type in the word bittern on haikufoundation.com. Uh, so of course, bittern highlights on the page. Surprise surprise. It's there. Yeah. What does that have to do with the bittern? I'm telling you right now. It's got a lot to do with the bittern. And uh, surprise surprise, who shows up? John Barlow, the very same editor of the Haiku Foundation's calendar. He wrote a book called The Bittern's Neck. So I'm thinking uh, birding is kind of an act of peace. So is the haiku form. One of the, one of the highest uh, art forms, I might add, is the, is the haiku. Uh, I love the haiku so very much. I really, I really do. I really do. And so I thought we should open and close the show every day, possibly, with the haiku. I mean, I'm not sure. I haven't run this one by you yet. I mean, I hate to run this by on air. You're close right there. I, I uh, What did you say? You said uh, something about... I love this haiku so much. I right. really do. And that's I the mean, thing. You're you halfway to a haiku. Right. You can't tell when you are making a haiku. I don't think they know how how to tell. So I'm I'm thinking. Well, anyways, I I check out. I'm checking out John Barlow, and uh, it is one of the highest art forms. I might add, haiku is. You. This guy loves the haiku. I, I did not know that about him. Well, yeah, well, we... You learn that's, something on this show you every, learn, every time. Well, it's something about me, but, I mean, that, well, you know. Hopefully about birds, Of course, too. right. So I'm searching online, and, and I'm thinking to myself, like, okay, so haikus, bitterns. I type in public domain haiku. This leads me to a forum-style site. It's called uh, the J- JapanesePages.com. <clears throat> now, there's a forum post in particular titled... Uh, public domain haiku with the it's got a it's it's got the que- that's it's not got a you. question mark the question yeah marks there. see I typed in public domain haiku no no period and then I get it I no get punctuation of I kind. get public domain haiku and um, so I posted it, this post was made by freedom that spelled a p um, which is why I had found it in the first place so I am going up and down the list of haikus listed and I only get to read one and so here is the official premiere on. Uh, of what I'd like to call Heron's Haiku on Aviary Paragraph. Don't complain to me that people kick you when you're down. 
it's your own fault for lying there. So I don't, I don't actually like. I gotta tell you, I don't actually like that haiku. It's a little too aggressive for me. I don't, I don't want to inspire our listening audience to go out there, and commit some sort of hate crime or some sort of vile act against, uh, you know, people. I don't want, to, you know, I don't condone this sort of violence. But it did get me inspired uh, on the show to close out, kind of with my own haiku, maybe possibly on the bittern, and uh, so continue to do that in the future on this show. We like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I just thought I'd, I'd bring that up. No, you know, I think it's a good idea. I think that we can stretch ourselves. We can uh, right. not just talk about birds, but really bring it into that haiku world. Now, if you were to say there's one bird fit for a haiku, um, what bird would you say that that is? One bird fit for a haiku. Barn swallow. Right. I might have said I might have said the American bittern, but that was that's pretty good that you you know thinking outside the box on that one. Um, me and Martin, we got to intro, intro the show on this one with uh, a little bit of um, what I'd like to call a uh, field trip. Steam producer Anna Glover went out snowshoeing in search of a special bird. Gray I'd say. jay. A gray jay. I don't know if anybody, everybody, everybody's heard of the blue jay. This is the gray jay. This is the gray jay. They got no teams. Yeah. They got, uh, I don't even think they're a state bird anywhere. All right, do birds have teams? Have they established well, teams, teams in the birding world? I'm more thinking of uh, more like baseball. See, I've or... always heard of it in flocks, and then if you get crows, they're kind of a more of a violent bird. A murder? No, no I, don't, I don't do that. I don't appreciate that violence. No, I show. think the murder is the, uh, uh, it's called a, it's a plural noun. Right. A group. It's, there are a lot of those interesting sort of uh, groups, a gaggle of geese. A gaggle of geese. Right, right. So how did you feel about that, that uh, Gray Jay when you, when you saw it? Yeah, I, every time I see them, they're just these beautiful mountain birds, you know, they, they somehow manage to make a life out there where you, you're kind of wondering, where do you find all that food? I gotta tell you, well, my favorite part of the trip when we were snowshoeing, uh, Anna Glover, our producer, she's got a couple of cashews on her on her the forefront of her palm. She reaches her hand, and you get to see a couple of gray jays come down, and those gray jays love to just take a little nibble of that cashew and they're just munching it, you know, digging away at that cashew. And I looked at it, I thought, wow, this is like, this is a little, uh, you know. Too hot for TV, you know what I'm saying? That's why we do this podcast here. That's why we do this podcast. Now, we probably got a lot of listeners at this point going, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. You got these guys over here at AP, AVA, Paragraph, they're out there feeding wildlife. What's going on with that? That's a good point. You bring that up. You shouldn't feed any wildlife. I don't care what type of wildlife. We don't want you feeding any types of birds out there. Unless they're in your, maybe birds in your backyard. I don't know. You know. Hey, what's your, what's your thoughts on this, Mike? Yeah, I mean, you got a bird feeder, right? You're you're providing the, the food there, you know, but you're not there. So the interesting thing with the gray jay... Right, you disconnect yourself. Yeah, right. so it's you're not really uh, habituating the bird to the human necessarily. Kind of like that, that whole internet thing. So the, so the gray jay, now, now that, that, you know, what it, you had a little bit more to say about the gray jay? Yeah, so the gray jay has a pretty interesting little life history. Okay. It, uh... Unlike other birds that, you know, maybe have learned to, ducks, for instance, maybe people feed them bread, they start going and eating Are you talking bread. about a specific type of duck now? We'll call it a mallard. Okay. So the gray jay will, uh, you know, it's evolved a little differently. So it's not so mm-hmm. much that a human is uh, habituating sure. the bird if they feed it. This is a bird that has actually evolved to take food. Mm-hmm. from large mammals oh wow wow yeah you don't see a bird like that all the time and when you um so yeah, as far as the eurasian bittern goes 
Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's back up there a second. Okay, yeah. Did you just say Eurasian? I bitter? said Eurasian. What are you laying down on us right now? As far as I know, it, the, the Eurasian bittern and the American... Those are two different types of bitterns. Now, I will say the Eurasian bittern usually tends to be in the Eurasian continental uh, landmass. Um, we did have an incredible sighting in Ireland of the American bittern. Now, what is it you think that makes these Eurasian bitterns, um, you know, sort of disappear when the Irish come out and are kind of looking for birds? I'm thinking there's any number of reasons right. that those birds could be disappearing. Yeah, and I mean, you know, you think about many different sort of Irish uh, cultural places over there, such as like, you know, Blarney Stone or, uh, you know, like uh, some sort of tavern or something like that. So before before we get any further into that, we will we'll have to talk a little bit more about this. Last week's segment of Spotter Sound. Now, we haven't set up the studio here for taking any sort of uh, calls, sort of in studio. Um, I got to tell you about that. Um, but I will say, uh, although we haven't uh, set up the studio, we do, or we are calling, um, uh, you know, somebody here to have them sort of take this uh, call. Uh, with uh, Martin in the studio. This is uh, this is our buddy uh, over here. Hey, hey, oh, Tim, is this Tim? Yeah, Tim. Hey, we got Tim Leckwe on the line right now. And um, let me tell you, uh, uh, Tim, Tim, are you there? Yeah. Okay, yeah. it's good to hear from you. It's good to hear from you, buddy. So, um, good to hear from you too, man. Yeah, so if we could uh, just, I'm going to introduce you on the show here, and if, if you could just keep a little quiet for a little bit, that would be uh, fantastic. Okay, he's he's a quiet man. Um, therefore, we have decided without a phone line, we'd reach out to our friend of the show, Tim Lecky, who has appeared in articles on bird migration in the JBLM Northwest Guardian newspaper and the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife's Wildlife Weekly. Is a wildlife and ecology uh, conservationist's nightmare and has participated in 100 percent of the fires which he started all across washington state you're telling me this guy sets fires he sets fires is he's he, gonna he's is, gonna set fire fire in the studio tonight is he an arsonist I'm tim yeah why, why don't you take this one what's that why, why don't you take why don't you take this one from martin he said he said right. so are you you set fires you're an arsonist do i set fires for arsonists <laughs> yeah. You know, but what is the reason you're you're setting fires? We got to really. It seems like our our guy Martin here didn't do his research. I'm actually I'm gonna have to I'm, you know I'm gonna have to maybe talk to him about that. Uh well, like uh, do uh, why do I set fires for uh, my organization or or just in in general? Well, just uh, how about your okay? We'll we'll do this a double prong approach. First, your organization. Second, individually. So you're kind of you're kind of disturbing everything. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. A natural form of uh, of disturbance. So like a uh, you know a, a flood would be a disturbance, or a uh, you know a volcano, or or a fire. Know, natural natural forms of uh, disturbance, and we you know nature needs that to to really to really thrive. Well, wow, buddy, I got to tell you, I could hear you talk for hours, but we do have a time limit here on the show. Uh, now, personally, why why are you starting fires out there? Uh, the fires, you know, the, the, oh, you mean uh, personally? Yeah, personally. Yeah. Let's let's hear um, the real Tim Leckie. I just I just love to love to watch things burn. You know, I guess uh, you know there there is a, a method behind the madness, but you know, there I do like the madness part of it. That, that's great to hear. I, lo I, I love that sort of thinking and that sort of thought process and, and like where you're going with that, everything associated with it, kind of the way you feel. So we're going to start you off here on Spotter Sound. Have you played the game before? Uh, I have not. This would be my first time. Okay, so uh, basically the way it goes is four sounds for you today. Uh, one that the, we didn't actually 
have the listening audience check out. And then the next three sounds are going to be first, a bird sound. Second, a bird sound and another sound. That's at the same time. At the same time. And then thirdly, just another sound. Okay. So this first sound we're going to be playing for you, this is the one we had our listener audience guess. It's a little bit timely. Um, basically, uh, when you know, uh, say ding ding, then we'll uh, go to either you or Martin in the studio uh, as far as um, uh, telling us what that sound is. Are you ready? Okay, that's great, man. Uh, just give me one sec. I'm going to pull up this sound for you on Spotter Sound. <laughs> ding, ding. You know what that is, Tim? Uh, ding, ding. Uh, that, is a, uh, that is a turkey. Oh, that's, that, was, that was great. That was great. Martin, what, did, what, were, you, what were you going to say? You know, I also was going to say that that was a uh, wild turkey. Well, I got to tell you, Martin did uh, say ding, ding first, so... Uh, Martin, that's one point for you on Spotter Sound. Or, uh, sorry, I mean, sorry, uh, Tim, that was one point for you on Spotter Sound. All right. So that's Tim in the lead with one point on Spotter Sound. This second sound we have for you guys out there. Okay, so here's that first sound. This is just a bird. As soon as you know, say ding, ding. All right. Or, hey, you know what? For the heck of it, let's just say gobble, gobble. All right. That's a double gobble. Okay. Are you ready? All right, here we go. Hey, hey, do we got any takers on this one? It sounded kind of like a, maybe a water, some kind of water fountain to me, but I, I don't know. Yeah. And uh, for you, Martin, what, what do you think? Yeah, I'm thinking we're l probably listening not only to waterfowl, but maybe even a seabird. It shames the show to have two experts come on and not know what the bird is. And I gotta tell you, the show is shamed. Um, we do have a famous 1934 recording of the Ivory Bill Ivory Woodpecker, Bill Woodpecker. In Louisiana. That's right, you guys heard it here first. We have a 1934 recording of the Ivory Bill Woodpecker. Now this thing's been in the news. Tim, have you heard about this? Yeah, I have heard about this. And Martin, uh, can you fill us in a little bit about it? Yeah, uh, Ivory Bill Woodpecker, you got a bird. There had been no recorded sightings in 60 years. The bird was thought to be extinct until one person in Arkansas reported a sighting of this bird. That immediately caught the attention of ornithologists worldwide. Bird lovers around the country began traveling, flocking to this wetland habitat where this Ivory Bill Woodpecker, supposed Ivory Bill Woodpecker, had been found. A number of other unconfirmed sightings came out and, uh, it ended up turning out that uh, the whole thing was a hoax. Okay, uh, now Tim, uh, now what do you think on this one? Hoax or no hoax? Uh, that is, uh, you know, I, I'm gonna say no hoax, you know, I'm a, I'm a believer. I'm a, a man of faith, so uh, I think it was no hoax. All right, but you heard it here first. Tim Lackwee, uh, an amazing environmental conservationist, has just said no hoax on the ivory billed woodpecker's resurgence. All right, so now, here on Spotter Sound, we have sound number two. Are you ready for this sound, Tim? I'm ready. Are you ready for this sound, Martin? I've never been more ready. Okay, again, this is going to be a bird and another sound. Gobble, gobble. All right, uh, uh, you know, actually, I'm going to say, Tim, did you say gobble, gobble there? I heard gobble, gobble. Uh, I did not. Okay, I will say on this uh, on this uh, third sound we have here on Splatter Sound, I did not realize that they do actually say the bird's name on it. So, um, you know, we're going to have to call this one a tie. That's uh, that's two to Tim and one to Martin with the, the also the, the parrot that was in the movie. That was a parrot? That was a parrot, yeah. Yeah, what were you going to say? Oh, uh, no, I, I'm embarrassed, man. Yeah, I guess, who cares, because you already lost. So, um, let's see. That, that Now, here's that fourth sound. Now, this is just a sound, guys. This is just a sound, and we're, we're going to try and guess on what this sound is. Are you ready? Yeah. All right, here we go.
gobble, gobble. Okay, we got a gobble here. Martin, what, what would you say that is? I would say that's a trombone. Tim, did you have any guesses there? Uh, maybe, I don't know, a trumpet. A trumpet. Okay, I'm afraid Martin was correct on that one. It was unfortunately a trombone. Now, Tim, you have two points. Martin, you have two points. I will, I will also mention that trombone playing before was by Christopher McIntyre's 7x7 trombone band. Uh, so we're going to play a little game of rock, paper, scissors. Now, uh, now, Martin, if you could please plug your ears. And Tim, I'd like you to give me your choice over the air. I'm going to go with rock this time. Okay, okay. And I'm going to go with paper. Okay, and unfortunately, uh, you've now lost spotter sound, Tim. Uh, <laughs> Whoa, we're, we're gonna have to bleep that out. <laughs> okay. Today's episode is actually on the bittern, and, and since we have you on the line, we thought we'd ask you a little bit about your experiences with the bittern in the fat past. You know, the bittern is a. Uh, it makes me feel kind of good, uh, and it, it's uh, it's uh, golfing sounds are they really uh, always always when the bittern's around. Wow, well, it's been excellent having you on the show, Martin. Would you like to say goodbye as well? Uh, Burger's goodbye to you, Tim. I agree, Burger's goodbye back to you as well. Thank you for uh, uh, for having me. I know those got those all of our boys over at JBLM uh, salute you, and uh, we here at, at AP also give you a, a, a nice, really firm uh, salute, Martin. I uh, will well, well, right back at you. It's, uh, it's been my pleasure. All right, take care. Yeah, you too. Bye. And here's the point on the show where I actually hand a little bit of the reins over to uh, Martin Salinas uh, in regards to this Bittern-themed episode. He had a little bit of Bittern-themed uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, um, so, uh, uh, some Bittern uh, stories, stories to share. Yeah, so this one, uh, great, a wonderful little book called Bird Lore. That's uh, Bird I was going to say it comes out of a hat. Cool. You might think that once you hear this story. So... Our story is entitled, and it's, our, our story is entitled, An Experience with an American Bittern. One day last fall, a newspaper in a nearby city printed a story of a strange bird in a battle with two savage bulldogs, and told how the local constable, whose aid was sought to shoot the bird, captured it by throwing a blanket over the bird's head and identified it as a Spanish Corseva, common in Argentina. It sounded like a real nature-faking story, yet thinking some member of the Heron family was in trouble, I traced it after considerable effort to an old stable, where, in a dark corner, I found an American bittern. The bird may have hit a wire or the branch of a tree and fallen to the ground in someone's dooryard, where it was attacked by the dogs, but it was useless to try and make the people believe that the bird had not been the aggressor and burst attacked the dog. The bittern did not appear injured, though weak from lack of food, the whole corn offered by its captor not being relished as a substitute for small fish and frog. So I thought to take it to the shore and let it go where food was plentiful. I had often heard stories of wounded herons striking at people's eyes. Nevertheless, I was taken unaware. A bit of an eye job, I'd say. When the bittern, with a lightning-like thrust, gave me an exhibition of how she speared fish. Fortunately, the blow fell on the end of my nose, and again within an inch of my eye. Kind of a nose job, I guess, though, if you look at it that way. Causing the blood to flow freely. And after that, I kept my face out of range. Not to uh, keep the violence on the show to a minimum, please. That is the end of that story. Wow, Sam. well, I've got to tell you, that was an amazing story. I loved literally every, every single uh, second of it. And yeah. it had me sort of enthralled. The real narrative of that, I feel like the pacing goes, it's, it's, it picks you up and takes right. you all over the place. It's kind of experimental. One. Yeah, it his, really is. Form. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I got to say, though, what was that constable thinking? Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know what he was thinking with all that stuff that he was, you know. Come on. Now, if you had a couple of dogs. Okay. Let's say they get in a fight with a bittern. What, what, type, you, of, what type of dog is it? We're talking about, let's see here, we're talking about savage bulldogs. Bulldogs. Ooh, I've never liked the bulldog, personally. So you got a couple of savage bulldogs. Sounds like you don't even like them. Right. And uh, they get in a fight with this bird. Okay. Constable comes, 
Constable sends his aide, mm-hmm. and uh, the aide identifies it as a Spanish Corseva. Wow. Okay. Uh, now, where are we? We are uh, on the East Coast. Okay, because I was going to say, I don't even know what planet I'm on. For the, you know, That's what I'm saying. For our saying. listening audience here. Thank goodness we had that birder in town. Yeah. Came down and said, Spanish Corseva. Okay, now that's an unusual uh, spot. This was actually an American bittern. Yeah, so I, I know there's a South American bittern as well. <sighs> this is pretty wild stuff. Yeah, no, that is pretty That is pretty wild. Uh, now, do you have a second? I heard you had a second story for us here. Mind. Coming out of Roger Tory Peterson. All right. Uh, that's R-T-P-I dot O-R-G. Now, in that story, we, uh, we hear from that blog, this is the American bittern. A stupendously cryptic and sensationally camouflaged heron species of freshwater and brackish marshes and wetlands. During late fall and winter, they can be infrequently found moving south to warmer or coastal areas where the water does not freeze. Even their movements are meant to blend in perfectly to surrounding vegetation. Stalking prey, including fish, amphibians, insects, mammals, reptiles, and more. The American bittern, now here's where the the story gets pretty intriguing. The American bittern was once a terror in the night to many early American settlers who lived in coastal regions. Its pumping, gurgling, resounding, and emphatic call would horrify colonists as if a deadly demon were beckoning them from the marshes. The noise would often draw them to arms, men dashing into the haunted lands to find and slay this terrible beast. I'm betting that most of the birds were able to easily elude their would-be attackers now, in the this pitch was black darkness. Very dark in its tone. It was kind of a grim look at the bittern. I almost say maybe a grim look at the American colonists. Yeah, you know, and they kind of um, were kind of sticklers when it came to, you know, sort of living by, uh, you know, Lord's Lord's word and all, everything like that. City on a hill. Yeah, but, um, you know, it is kind of unusual. We were talking about it earlier, uh, how the bittern has kind of been a very reactionary bird in his tone. Yeah. How, how do you react to that? Bittern? Right. Especially with its head, the way that it wobbles in the wind. And the way that um, the bittern's call sort of lengthens over time as you're listening to it. And you could be hearing that call from anywhere. The bird itself might be a mile yeah. from where you're standing. Well, that's I didn't know that. That's what Actually, I'm talking about. That wow. bird throws that call. Now, over what else do you know about the bittern? Kind of like rain down on us here at the show you know what i mean i'm talking about air sacs we watched the greater sage grouse last week pumping up its air sacs bellowing out on its lack this week we're talking about the american bittern also that was a, a beautiful display by the mm-hmm. way i gotta say beautiful display in the bittern as yeah. well really just uh has a tide of air coming through its esophagus filling up those air sacs then expelling almost a, a, a mellifluous burp it seems to me that the bittern offers almost everything you could ask from a bird. You know, I think that assessment, I've never thought of it that way. But you may be onto something, Zan. Well, thanks, thanks a lot, Martin. I, I, I like to look at it that way as well. Um, now, besides its bellowing call through that esophageal tract, bittern also finds itself to be a bit of a loner amongst the bird kingdom. This is a bird that rarely, other than its very short breeding season, would be seen in a flock of its kind. This is a bird, a heron, that low walks. It's not an upright walker. It kind of slinks through the marsh grasses and Mm -hmm. sedges. It walks carefully along the water's edge. And just when you think it's going to come out into the open, it almost makes itself invisible among those grasses. Yeah, it's interesting when you see that bird uh, come out in the open, you're kind of thinking, well... What is it doing out here? Um, I actually was looking at um, uh, sort of this video um, on YouTube. There was a a picture of a bittern, and it was moving. And the bittern um, was feeding its young. And this one, uh, if you have any kids at home, I encourage you to please, uh, you know, turn down your volume for a minute at a time, just uh, for a sec here, because what I'm about to say is actually, uh, you know, a little bit gross, I gotta gotta honestly say. The father uh, bittern came to its children and was regurgitating tiny little fish in all of its children's mouths. Now, it may be a surprise to... You can turn your volume back up now. 
This may be a surprise to some of our listeners, but this is actually a common behavior among many birds. Their paternal instincts actually cause them to... A little bit gross, wouldn't you say? All right, well, that was uh, that was our segment on the bittern for this show, uh, which is about the bittern. Um, our next uh, segment here is, of course, a very serious segment, I got to tell you. Do you like birds? Personally? Yeah, personally. I love birds. That's good to hear, because um, actually this next uh, segment, we're going to talk about something that all birders will love if they're losing their hearing. There's a big caveat there. If they're losing their hearing. you heard Now, neither of us... Um, as far as I know, have substantial hearing loss. Uh, What's that, Zam? <laughs> <laughs> that was that was a pretty good one. That we just like to play around in the studio sometimes. That's all right. Uh, so I got to tell you, if you guys have the internet, please type in your web browser hearbirdsagain.com. That was hearbirdsagain.com. Now there is a little gadget available for our um, maybe our older folks out there, maybe our younger folks out there. Uh, really depends on what your age is. Uh, it's called the Song Finder. It's a bird uh, song finder. Um, it's also a digital hearing aid that uh, you know uh, you can use. Wow. Uh, so what owners have to say on the website? Gerald Book loves it. Joe O'Connell, he thinks it's the best thing he's ever purchased. He's better than sliced bread to this guy. Uh, here we got Thomas Peterson. He's ecstatic about it. Gene Her- Herzberg, he. This is nothing short of miraculous. Chuck Fulmer, he can't believe we invented it. Fits neatly in the shirt pocket, I gotta tell you. This thing, it just sits right on your ears. It lets you hear those high-frequency bird calls and those low-frequency bird calls, kind of when that bird hits that high note and that low note. I can't tell you how many times, Dan, I've been out personally with some of the older birders. They just don't have that same frequency range. Right. So I'll be standing there, I'll be hearing a, a variety of warbler mm-hmm. species. They're clueless. And is that uncomfortable for them? You know, the moment when they realize what I'm doing, yeah, I think they feel a little uncomfortable. Clearly, uh, these are not users of this pretty fantastic product, as far as I can tell. Yeah, the Song Finder, I gotta say, it's it's probably a comfort issue as well for our older birders. If you want to be comfortable around younger birders who are spotting more sounds than you are, if you have this hearing aid in, you're going to spot just as many sounds as them, if not more. There are reports, unverified reports, that you may hear more at a higher level of birds out there today. Wow. Yeah. So you're kind of, this is taking it to that, you're a bionic birder. With, uh... <laughs> a bit of a bionic birder, if I, if I don't say so myself, which you said. Now, look, if you look at the traditional mo- uh, solutions to amplification aids, you know, they're ridiculous. you got to check out Hear Birds again, because if you this check out... This is a great website. <laughs> I'm looking a... <laughs> at this picture here. You know, we're going to we're gonna actually... Uh, our cover for this show is, is a picture available on uh, hearbirdsagain.com. It shows you one of those old school bir- uh, bird amplification aids. And this guy we're looking at, you, you can pretty much, for those listeners out there, uh, not around a computer, we got a guy, he's, uh, he's, he's got his head leaning into this apparatus. In some sort of contraption, I'd say. It makes it look like a man with elephant's ears. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a, like a, kind satellite, of a silly a looking satellite device. a satellite disc. Yeah. Uh, split in half, kind of placed looks, on the side of his noggin. Yeah, he's <laughs> kind of looks like uh, sort of a silly, uh, sort of a silly guy, you know. Um, but if you don't want to look like a silly guy, you will find the Song Finder um, as a frequency shifting solution, as said on their site. Found hearing loss, uh, you know, moderate hearing loss, um, normal hearing. Works for everybody, pretty much. A one out of ten, Martin. Now, what would you give it, maybe? I'd have to go with a uh, two. A two. Oh, that's that's not exactly your best um, rating. Now, what what why is that? That kind of intrigues me when you say ten out of two. Yeah, you know, with a product like this, uh, it's not for everybody. It's not. Wait for a minute. Everybody. I just I just got that. It's not for yeah. everybody. Okay. <laughs> wow. Yeah. No, I kind of I kind of understand you there now. Could you go into that a little bit more though? For the people who don't understand that? You know, I'm thinking this is a great product. Yeah. But uh, am I thinking this thing is going to be selling millions of units every day? Right. Uh, Maybe not. You know, I think uh, this product might be something that's good for a select group of people. Yeah, I suppose you'd have to figure out a little bit more about birder demographics to figure out how much of these things are going off the shelf. Kind of do a little bit of market research. Because we don't want you going out and spending your $750 aimlessly. Uh, if you don't need this product, if you're already hearing birds, 
I uh, will say this though, if you if you had a little trouble hearing spotter sound, maybe this you, product maybe is this for product you. is for you. <laughs> yeah, you know, because we don't want to uh, end the show on sort of a bad a bad note. In fact, if you have any trouble hearing this, <laughs> then maybe this product is for you. So that is going to be. Uh, towards the end of this episode. Um, now, Martin, did you have anything else to leave our listening audience with? Yeah, I would just say uh, I know that the American veteran for many people uh, definitely can be a nemesis bird. Now, Zan, are you familiar with this idea of a nemesis bird? I gotta tell you, I'm not, but I like it. So, birders out there in the bird sphere, mm -hmm. many of them will find that they have a nemesis bird. I'm guessing bird. starling for a lot of them. Mm, not quite starling. You're close, but let's take it down to the basics here. The real, f yeah. a nemesis bird is a bird that you maybe have planned two, three, four, six trip, where you're going out to seek out that bird, mm -hmm. and you go All out, right. and you don't see it, and you get a phone call from your birding buddies. Now, are these birds diurnal? They could be diurnal, they could be nocturnal. Your okay. nemesis bird all depends on your situation. If you have maybe a night job, then you're you more likely probably have a nemesis bird that's a nocturnal bird, you're saying? Maybe, yeah, you, you've, you've gone out to try and find it, you took work off, but you couldn't find it, your buddy calls you up, 15 minutes later says, I just saw the bird. A bird that just constantly seems to elude you and you only. The bittern is that bird for so many birders out there. Wow. So I just challenge you, if it's your nemesis bird, friend, don't give up. Go out there. Find that bittern. We're rooting for you, and we're giving you a big salute over here at Aviary Paragraph. That's AP. We, you know, we salute you so much. Now, I would uh, just like to set, I'd like to end this show on a little, uh, sort of a poetic note, you could, you could call it. It's uh, a haiku I've come up with uh, regarding the bittern. Yeah, I know. So thanks a lot, and uh, have a good one. This is uh, Zan Mars signing off, and Martin Salinas signing off. Take care.